Welcome back, everyone. I hope we had a chance to get caffeinated and get a uh, sugary treat of some description. I saw some pretty impressive donuts earlier, saw a lot of pastries floating around, so hopefully we are ready to go for what I'm excited to, um, and I have no doubt will be a dynamic conversation. If you didn't have anything spicy for your morning tea, I'm pretty confident this conversation will deliver your need for spice. Uh, I'm going to welcome in just a moment Tom Goodwin, but before I do, I want to give you a little context for who Tom is and why I'm so excited that he's here and joining us today. So, Tom Goodwin has four times been voted LinkedIn's number one voice in marketing. He's got uh, over 725,000 followers on the platform. He currently heads up All We Have Is Now, which is a digital transformation business consultancy, which is designed to help unleash the power of new technologies in uh, business. He's also the host of The Edge, which is a TV series focused on technology and innovation and a podcast called My Wildest Prediction. Uh, in 2021, he published the second edition of his book called Digital Darwinism, and he's spoken in over 100 cities across 45 countries. We're thrilled he's joining us here in Calgary today. Please welcome Tom Goodwin. Thank you. Welcome, welcome. Thank you so very much. So good to have you here. It's good to be here. Um, it's funny because Tom and I were talking before and uh, you were saying you often get described as a contrarian, that is often how I've seen you referred to, someone who kind of comes in and provides punchy critiques, but you're overwhelming and op overwhelmingly an optimist, aren't you? Yes, I actually think um, to be alive today, we almost have a duty to be optimistic. Mm. You know, when you are optimistic, you're able to solve problems with more clarity, with more imagination, um, in a more proactive way. Um, and we're in this really weird period of time where it's almost become fashionable to be pessimistic. <laughs> yes. You know, people think that to be optimistic is to be ignorant, it's to be unaware of your privilege, um, it's to be incapable of empathy and to see the problems in the world. I actually, I, I don't think that's true. Like, we have a track record as a species of making amazing things happen, mm. um, improving almost every aspect of our life. Um, and I think it's become quite fashionable to dismiss that. And that's one of the things I'm most excited to talk to you about. We might come back to kind of unleashing disruption a little bit later, because first I thought it would just be interesting, as someone who, you know, specializes in kind of marketing and digital business, coming into the industry as more of an outsider, looking yes. in at energy, what do you think we're getting wrong? Where, where do you think there are misdirects or misconnections that are going on here? And I'd, I'd love your kind of observation on maybe something we're missing. It's weird being a generalist because people always assume that means that you don't know enough to be helpful. <laughs> um, and I think there's something remarkable that happens when you see change in context. Mm. Um, so when you are lucky enough like me to be able to fly around and see the world, and when you work in different industries, and when you're not that close to it, um, you get this amazing sense of clarity, and you can see all the, the misdirections. Now, when you talk about the industry, it, it, it's quite hard because there's so many different It's a big umbrella. Parts. Um, Take and, it however you like. And, and you have such a kind of complicated array of, of stakeholders. You know, it, it, to some extent, your, your customers are governments. To some extent, it's the, the media and reputation. And to some extent, it's end users. To some extent, it's, it's wholesalers. Um, I think you're doing a bad job of bringing people with you. Mm -hmm. um, I think you're focused on yourself and your own problems. Um, and you're, you're doing a, a poor job of relating to people. Um, yeah, any one of those cohorts of stakeholders in particular? I, I, I mean, sort of at the Consumer? end customer, yeah. you know, like normal people in the world. And um, it, it, it's odd because, you know, mostly my job uh, is primarily saying things that are quite obvious that, that people don't think about enough. Um, and a weird thing happens when we do our job, um, where we sort of wake up in the kitchen and we're worried about our, you know, daughter being bullied or our kids not leaving the house and we're worried about... Um, the gas bill, um, and then we, we come into work and we sort of take off our human being head uh, and we put on our business head. In our, in our business head, we sit in meetings and we kind of say what people expect us to say, um, and we completely forget what it was like to be a human being that morning, and we, and we completely forget the context in which we see this stuff. Um, and I think it's, it's really, really important for, for there to be people in every room that are there just to represent common sense and the voice of normal people. Um, and it's with that empathy that you can solve many of the problems that you have. It's with that empathy that you have um, a canvas in which to figure out 
what products and services to make, but also more importantly, how to, how to market and, and communicate that. Um, can I push you a little bit more on the observation around not bringing people along well? Because I, I liked what Yuval said area, earlier about this piece on how do we get clear on what problems we need to solve? And, and I wondered if you could hone in a little bit more on what do you think's the breakdown? Is it that we're not communicating about the right things? Is it that we're not doing it in the right channels? Is it that it's not happening frequently enough? I mean, I, I take your point that we've probably maybe um, lacking perspective on what it's like to be in the end user's shoes. So I hear that really clearly in what you said there. But is there anything else you'd call out? Um, the, the, my biggest fear in the world right now um, is that the world is incredibly divided. Um, this is not a new idea. I'm not saying anything that, that you don't know. But we, we really don't understand the degree to which um, society is very fractured. There's a complete breakdown in trust between people and governments, but also people and one another. Mm. And I think it's highly likely that your consumer base is um, one of three different tribes. There's the tribe that is receptive to this, um, is open to embracing sort of new progressive, sustainable behaviors, and it's become part of their identity. Um, and they're happy to pay a, a premium for that. Um, there's a lot of people who are aware of the problems in the world and they believe in climate change and they believe it's man-made, um, but they're just not able to consider this to be the most important thing in their life. Um, and then there's a lot of people that are against it and they, they distrust it and they're antagonistic and they're rebellious against it. And I think, um, a bit like politicians actually, like people are doing a very good job of energizing their base mm -hmm. and they're doing an absolutely terrible job of bringing other people into it. Um, we're doing a very bad job of, of reaching out to people and slowly bringing this in. Instead, we're more keen on, on sort of preaching to the converted. And maybe I'd be interested for your lessons or observations around what we can be more thoughtful about doing as leaders, because it strikes me, you know, a lot of marketing is about, and this is a very non-marketer definition here, so I apologize if this is very <laughs> <laughs> offensive to the profession, but it, it, it's um, motivating people to make a decision. Often yes. that's a decision to, to purchase, maybe in the instance of a, uh, a public service announcement, it's to make a different choice. Uh, you know, there's a range of reasons, but ultimately we're trying to influence people. Absolutely. Um, so That's yeah. a very good definition of marketing. Oh, thank for... gosh. Okay, I was worried I was going like, to really offend you there. But um, I was interested in, let's take an example of the growing reluctance, and I hear this commented on in a lot of circles, and we can see data that points to it, around resistance to sort of paying green premiums. Affordability is a really genuine challenge. Cost of living is creating pressures all across the world. Um, maybe there's a parallel you can draw from a marketing campaign in another industry around how do you work against some of those forces to continue to motivate more of the behavior you need to see? Well, we've become very dismissive of, of, of our audience and of people. Um, we have fallen out of love with the idea that it's our job to understand people and to respect them. Um, this is a kind of marketing kind of conversation right now, but, but generally speaking, marketers, um, you know, 20 years ago, they had a fondness, they had a curiosity, they had a respect for their customers. And now it's become quite popular to be dismissive, um, to actually have very little interest in their lives. How does that work? Because I feel like all I hear from business is customer centricity, customer centricity. It's that feels... one of those good examples of words that people say because it's the, it's the sort of soundtrack it's to conversation. To be said. I mean, you know, ask, ask companies how they're doing that. They'll talk about dashboards. No, they won't talk about walking down Main Street. They won't talk about being in third tier Chinese cities and mm. looking at how people behave. Um, we fall in love with the kind of, I call it the kind of arithmetocracy, where we're looking for data to understand things, not feelings. Um, yeah, I, I think we, we've, we've fallen out of love with our consumers. We need to understand the, the role in which we play in people's lives. And what, what you realize is people are really smart. Like, people are really well-intentioned. Um, people are doing their best. Um, they're overwhelmed. They are utterly, utterly overwhelmed. So quite often when we think that people are stupid, um, what we're really dealing with is people that are making too many decisions. Um, they don't know what it is to be a human being in the 21st century. Um, and the way to help them is to make their decisions easier. Mm. Uh, in marketing, we always think that better wins. We think that cheaper wins. Um, you know, TikTok is not better content. Uh, Netflix is not better content. Um, we do things because they're easy. We spend our whole lives on our mobile phone because everything is easy. Um, so the more that you can do to make these behaviors easy, 
um, the more that you can do to make the progress, the process of transformation uh, seamless, the more that you can uh, predict people's concerns and proactively address them, uh, the more that you can normalize this behavior, uh, the more that you can bring the kind of you know, mass market with you. Um, you know, social norming is an incredibly powerful mm. um, force. You know, we're still at a point where organic food is seen as being a sort of a premium, crunchy granola thing rather than norm normal thing. <laughs> we still think that cooking a good meal for our kids is somewhat elitist. Um, th there is a kind of level of distrust and pretentiousness almost about you know, responsible behaviors. Um, and we need to find a way to sort of normalize it and to make it just the way that you live our life. I feel like sometimes it's useful, um, particularly in this age where we really feel like we're in this, to use a word we used earlier, transition around skills and approaches where we sort of are moving off a, a set of strategies and skills that we know are outmoded for the current reality, but we haven't quite worked out what ones work. Are there any reference points you draw our attention to for people that you think are doing a really good job from a communication standpoint at this moment in time? Um, the, 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 the communications environment is so fragmented and so complex and so driven by data points that it's actually really hard to ever see companies that are communicating with the kind of clarity and with the, the scale that they need to. Um, you know, I always struggle to think of examples of companies that are doing this stuff well. Um, and I don't like saying that, but I think it, it's better in these conversations rather than to look at the past um, and to look at what other people are doing. It, it's better to start out with a canvas, um, which is everything that is now possible. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, in some ways, the media landscape is more simple than ever. Mm. Um, it's all digital. Um, in, in some ways, we have the best ever devices you could ever create for marketing. You know, the mobile phone is incredible. Um, the dynamics of, of algorithm and social sharing um, make it easier for messages to spread. Um, we have this incredible sort of platform. Um, I think what companies need to do is they need to ha have a stronger sense of their role in people's lives. Um, they need to have a c more clearly defined vision. Um, they need to be more patient about how long it will take to execute against that vision. And then they need to ensure that they have a communications framework which is extremely clear, um, which is ambitious in scope, but not ambitious in complexity. Um, and they continue to sort of drive the same messages for a long period of time. Mm. Uh, for some reason in marketing, everyone's become very short-termist. You know, people get bored of their logos, people get bored of their taglines. Uh, people think that jingles are old-fashioned. Um, you know, all of the things that we knew about marketing in 1900 are still true today. Hmm. Um, you know, it's actually amazing to look at, at some of the discussions that happened in the past. You know, a lot of the conversations around the digital age and then a, about AI remind me of conversations that people had about electricity, um, the, the complexity in the market, the struggle for business models, um, the lack of immediate use cases. Um, it takes a really long time for us to understand technology. Mm. It takes a really long time for the meaning to dissipate. Um, but one always gets to this incredible moment where we start to understand what the technology means and we start to rethink many of the, the fundamental principles of our life. And it's that, it's that period normally 15 to 25 years into the technology where amazing things happen. Um, and I think a lot of the time with this technology, you know, it feels like it's not working, it feels like it's complicated. It, it's just the middle stage of a technology and it's always been this way. Speaking of kind of disruption and waves of technology, you think about this topic a lot. And I'm mindful of a lot of people sitting in the room uh, are working for large organizations and I think would probably identify with, with uh, feeling like a change maker, wanting to be someone that is a positive contributor to their organization, their community, et cetera. Um, and so I'm interested for the lessons that you've learned in being a student of disruption. Uh, what can, how, how do we encourage uh, ideas to move from something in our head to beyond us? <laughs> I, I think about this all the, all the time, actually. Um, and I'm, f first of all, I want to acknowledge how hard it is to be those people. Um, you know, companies get a very bad press for being big. You know, there, there was a long time where people talked about how, you know, small companies are going to eat big companies, and, you know, small companies always stand at conferences and talk about the exciting things they're doing. You know, big companies are amazing. Big companies are full of very hardworking, very well-intentioned people. They make tons of money. Um, they're beholden to shareholder expectations. Um, but the reality is they are the sort of oil tankers of the world, and they're, they're very hard to change. Um, what is much more likely 
um, a, bit, a bit like Yuval was talking about, you know, you, you don't sort of take stories away from people, you replace them with a new story. Mm -hmm. um, I, I am gradually coming to the conclusion that the way to change very big companies is not to, to change them, but to build on a new entity. Okay. Um, you know, it, it's not the case that companies can self-disrupt. It's that they can set up new business units with new people, uh, with new reporting structures and new cultures. Um, and the goal is for that entity um, to become the sort of future vessel. So that approach that we've seen where people will intentionally carve out a, an independent innovation unit or there'll be a skunk works type of entity yes. that will play the role of being this engine of different thinking and opportunity. The, the, the problem is always scaling that. Yeah. Companies, companies are very good at sort of modular, containerized, small scale evolution. Um, they're not good at, at, at supporting that vessel to make it become medium sized and then big. What are the ones who do that well do differently? Um, I spent five years researching that question for my book, um, and I was never really able to come up with uh, examples of companies that have done this. Oh, right. Um, you know, Telefonica did a great thing with GIFGAF. Uh, BMW did an interesting thing with iSeries. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, if I was to write another book again, it would be to, to figure out how companies can do this. I think that the perfect metaphor for this is, is, is having children. You know, as, as we get older uh, and, and wiser and, and wealthier, um, our bodies degrade and our minds degrade, um, and we become set in our ways to some extent. Mm. And the way to deal with that is not to have cosmetic surgery and to pretend to be young, um, it's to have kids. And it's to recognize that the way to allow our spirit and our ideas and our values to flourish, you know, or in the case of businesses, our you know, um, it's to nurture something new into the world. Um, and then the questions become, how do you create an, an environment where that entity can flourish? Mm. How do you give it support where it belongs? You know, how do you give it a, a, a role and a meaning and clarity? So what does that look like? How do, if we're going to have more corporate kids, which yeah. uh, I love as sort of an analogy <laughs> that we're drawing, uh, in the way that we think about, you know, making sure we clothe our kids and we feed them well and we send them to good schools. That's precisely. Yeah. What, are the, what are the conditions uh, on the corporate side for growing good corporate kids? Uh, freedom. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you see this in M&A all the time. You know, large companies will buy small companies, and the idea is, you know, we have these, you know, brilliant new minds. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to go over this because we all know it, but you end up asking these people to use the same reporting software. You know, you tell them that... And meet the same uh, quarterly targets. You know, yeah. Yep. You, you, you tell them they can't use Max anymore. You tell them that they can't uh, choose their own expenses policy. And, and you basically sort of undermine everything that made them brilliant. Um, you know, I have thought long and hard about this, and the metaphor of kids is perfect. You know, give them like an emergency credit card. Um, you know, don't ask them to tell you what they're going to do. Um, offer them support when they want it on their terms. You know, talk about an environment of, of experimentation and learning from that. You know, give them love, but don't suffocate them. Um, provide sort of mental clarity and a, a sense of purpose. You know, give them shelter, but don't ask them to sort of live with you. Um, it, it, in many ways, it's, it's a remarkably good metaphor. Uh, on your study of innovative companies, you know, sometimes we talk about whether, you know, take leadership, we sort of say this question, are good leaders born or are they made? And, and I guess I'm interested in that question. We talk a lot about how critical out-of-the-box thinking is yeah. to enabling the sort of disruption that you're talking about. Do you think that that is a muscle that can be built? And unfortunately, what's happened a lot of the time is we're not environments that encourage that muscle, and so it's been atrophied. Or do you really think that, that some people just have this kind of creative spark, and so it's about identifying that talent and bringing them into your team to spark it? I mean, by far the most important thing in innovation is culture. Um, you know, culture is what people do. It, it's the behavior that you celebrate. It's the behavior that you tolerate. Um, Companies are extremely good at saying the right things. Like companies are really good at the photo shoot for the hackathon. Um, companies need to, to mean this. Like companies need to like genuinely want this. Um, and I think all too often companies pretend, and then I think staff get quite confused because the, the sort of actions and the words don't line up. Yeah. You know, we talk a lot about companies sort of taking risks. You know, you, you go to a sort of 1950s campus on the edge of a town and there's a canteen with a kind of a laminated poster in the, the kitchen about, in the canteen about, you know, breaking rules and, you know, driving a different way to work every day and we're a culture of ruthless experimentation, you know, and then you put in a request to, you know, change the bagels and there's not a, 
a way to do <laughs> You're that. You're thinking about the ink in the you photocopier. Know, you, need a, you need a sort of a meeting to talk about a meeting to talk about disruptive behavior and breaking oh, the rules. Meetings. Yep. You know, so companies need to like, you know, genuinely want this because maybe maybe they don't want it. Like that's fine. Like not every company needs to be innovative. Um, they need to sort of figure out if they want it. They have to figure out what that involves. And then they have to sort of imbue it in everything they do. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their recruitment policy uh, should be innovative. Their expensive policy should be innovative. Uh, the way that they work should be innovative. Um, the way that people um, are able to create business cases should be removed. So to your point earlier, we need a blank canvas for all of it again, versus retrofitting something after we've inherited the legacy of what was. I think so, and it, and it makes our jobs amazing. I mean, I think mm. we are in this weird moment in time where in many ways, many aspects of our life have never been so good. Um, but a lot of people are not enjoying their jobs as much as they should do. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are scared to lose their jobs. A lot of people, um, their jobs have become much more about compliance. Um, you know, th this is almost like a sort of challenge for every single person in the room, which is to rethink what makes a good day. You know, is a good day one where you weren't scared? Is a good day where you got home to see the kids before they went to bed? Is a good day a day where you got upgraded, you know, on your flight? Um, or was a good day one where you made something happen that you felt proud of? Mm. Um, and I think that being proud of the things that we can accomplish you know, should almost be our kind of north star in every meeting we're in. We're not trying to get through the meeting, we're trying to make something happen that we feel really proud to be a part of. Yeah. Now, unfortunately, Tom, our time is drawn to a close, but I did want to ask you one final thing. You mentioned at the start, sort of pessimism has become trendy. You know, you've all talked about this pretty average information diet most of us are living on, where if you open your feed, it's pretty easy to feel negative about the state of the world. Um, how do you stay optimistic? What do you intentionally and deliberately do? Um, if you are able to, um, you know, as, as a mental experiment, if you were able to have complete visibility into every single thing that happened in the world, um, if you were able to see every single data point, um, it would be impossible not to come to the conclusion that almost every single thing is better. Um, so the way that I maintain optimism is just to maintain an objective way of looking at reality. I think as a species, um, we have an enormous capacity to have the same number of problems in our heads. Um, so every day we probably have 100 problems. Every world leader probably has 100 problems. The reality is those problems have become a lot better. Mm. You know, we used to be outraged because, you know, women would die during childbirth, and now we get outraged because, you know, we weren't able to change the seat on our flight. Um, you know, we have better quality problems than we've ever had before. And one can either look at those problems and go, wow, we've still got problems, or we can look at the nature and the, the quality of those problems and think we are now have better problems than ever, and we have much better tools than we've ever we had to, to do them. that. Like, technology is, is a mirror, and it's a lever. And often we look at the reflection in it, and we don't like it, and we forget it's us that we're looking at. Um, it's a lever. It, it can make us do extraordinary things. Um, we tend to focus on, on faster, we focus on cheaper. You know, I think now with AI helping us do our jobs, now is the perfect time to focus on better. You know, how can we make better products and services and better businesses um, that make it a pleasure to live a life today? What a great note to finish on. Can you join me everyone in thanking Tom Goodwin so much for being here with us.